Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? In this episode of the podcast, we're talking about how a large media company just got even bigger. People involved in the entertainment industry are getting fed up with internet trolls and how Sony is upping the ante when it comes to locking down cross-platform gaming. All right, so let's get straight into this one. First story is about how AT&T has been allowed to buy Time Warner. Now, if you're not in the US, you may have heard of AT&T, but they are one of the largest communications companies in the US, if not the world, they have a pretty broad reach. They've traditionally been known for providing internet and telecom access to businesses and consumers. And then not terribly long ago, they also purchased the DirecTV satellite television service. Now, a while back, it proposed buying Time Warner, who shouldn't be confused with Time Warner Communications, which then got folded into Charter Communications and turned into Spectrum which is a series of internet service providers and cable TV distributors in various parts of the US. But Time Warner, which is the media group, and it operates things like HBO, CNN, Warner Brothers Studios, Turner Entertainment, a whole bunch of others. Time Warner is an absolutely huge company in and of itself. And AT&T basically proposed to merge, aka buy, Time Warner. Now, the U.S. Department of Justice opposed the merger from the beginning out of concerns with antitrust regulation, right? It would make that company too big. Effectively, it would just mean that AT&T would have even more control over a larger swath of media in the U.S. and its distribution. Now, what was really surprising, though, is that a judge in the Washington, D.C. District Court actually approved that merger. And it was completed two days later, literally two days after the judge said, yeah, you guys can go ahead. That deal was finalized. You can kind of tell that AT&T and Time Warner were chomping at the bit to get that deal done. I can't ever think of any other large business transaction. I mean, this is a, an agreement that is talking about billions with a B of dollars. This isn't just some small time deal. I can't think of any other transaction that's happened in business to that scale that's been done that quickly. So it kind of makes you think, you know, what was going on there? But regardless, the deal was okayed and it was finalized two days later. Now, a lot of people are considering it a horrible decision, myself included, and I'll include a link down in the description to an excellent article by The Verge that kind of breaks down that judge's opinion. More or less, the opinion was flawed and not rooted in the reality of how media and communication works today. It's a fantastic article that was written. I encourage you to read it if you want to see bits and pieces of the actual big judge's opinion and breaking down why each one of those is wrong. To do that here would be an episode in and of itself, and I think most of you would be bored, but I'll include that link down below in case you do want to read up on it. But you know, ultimately, this merger is going to mean less choice and higher costs for those who want access to either that content or those media groups, especially considering the recent death of net neutrality. It means things that uh, like AT&T can charge other cable and content distribution networks, Internet service providers more for that content because there's no longer that separation between the place that distributes the content and the place that actually creates it. They normally would have to broker a deal on their own. Now they're basically in cahoots with each other and they can collaborate to make sure that all of the AT&T customers who maybe have internet service through them or cable TV through them or direct TV service through them, make sure that they all have access to all of that Time Warner media while at the same time raising prices for that same media to 
other competing cable TV networks and internet service providers. It can also do things like driving customers towards AT&T service. Hey, maybe you don't already have AT&T now. Wouldn't it be nice if you had access to HBO and CNN and all that for a lower cost? And it can do things like that through the concept of zero rating. And this really comes down to the net neutrality part of it where previously they would have to provide access to like the streaming services equally to any internet service provider. But now that net neutrality is dead, they can broker deals where let's say maybe you have internet service through Comcast or Verizon, not through AT&T, but you wanna sign up for HBO streaming services. Previously, they couldn't charge Comcast or Verizon to allow those customers access to those services. Now that net neutrality is dead, they could come up with a deal with that. The way to sweeten the deal for consumers to switch to AT&T services is to say, oh, hey, yeah, you know, if you switch to AT&T, you can get HBO for free or you'll get it at a lower cost or the concept of zero rating where it'll be like, hey, have you ever wanted to watch HBO on your phone but you've been worried about running out of data in your plan? Well, if you switch to AT&T for your service, we'll just say you can have all the HBO you want to watch and not count that against your data. Because now they're vertically integrated, so to speak, they can do that kind of stuff and ultimately the consumers are just going to get hurt. Now, while this deal is bad on its own, it's even worse because it was enforced through a court decision. The, the problem with court decisions like this is that they never really just stand on their own. Court decisions are really all about precedent, either following previous precedents or creating new ones. So this decision to allow a large content distributor to merge with a large content producer will ultimately pave the way for future mergers just like it, which means less competition, higher costs for everybody, and well, that's just not okay. And speaking of not okay, not too long ago, actor Kelly Marie Tran seemingly gave up on social media. You may remember her as playing the character Rose in Star Wars The Last Jedi. Now, admittedly, that character was a bit, let's say, polarizing among diehard Star Wars fans. But rather absurdly, those fans expressed their displeasure with the character by complaining to Kelly Marie herself herself and basically just giving her a really hard time about it instead of oh I don't know complaining to the writers who actually wrote that character and everything that character said and did Kelly Marie just acted right she was given a script do these things say these things that's your job and she did what she was told but for whatever reason, those fans that took exception to that character, either in terms of what the character said or did, or just the fact that the character existed in the movie, decided to give Kelly Marie Tran a really hard time on the internet. You know, it's, it's a deal where complaints are one thing. And especially if you're a public figure, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have to deal with that, right? I deal with complaints and, and a little bit of that all the time, even just in my, corner of the internet here on YouTube. But there's apparently a point with her where it escalated, not just to trolling, but just downright harassment. So it got so bad, she apparently just said, screw it, this isn't worth it anymore, and shut down her Instagram account, deleted all of her posts, just said, she's done. Now, that's of course, really unfortunate to see. I feel sorry for, I know fandom can be really toxic at times and there are people that can go way over the edge in terms of how they feel like they kind of own the subject of their fandom where they feel like Star Wars is theirs and anything that goes against it is wrong where if it doesn't follow their vision for what that franchise should be, then, you know, that must be attacked and, and, you know, set straight or whatever. But 
you know, it, it's it's gotten to a point where I think things are really hitting a tipping point. And what it seems like now, finally, is that the reaction from those who are basically getting trolled, being harassed, that's starting to change, specifically amongst people who are working in the creative or entertainment industry. Now, in the world of public relations, which all of the people who are very visible in that kind of industry always have to keep in mind because not only do they usually work for a company, but they also kind of work for themselves. They have their own brand, so to speak, to look out for. But in the world of public relations, you, you kind of always want to project this positive image and make everyone feel welcome regardless of who they are, which is generally a good thing. And that's ultimately just to get people to feel comfortable to buy your product, right? You don't want to seem like you're limiting your product scope just to certain people to the exclusion of everybody else. Generally, the idea has been, well, you know what? Anybody's money is good enough for you, so you might as well just go ahead and take it. The problem, though, is that this has generally included the act of glossing over some of the, let's say, less appealing aspects of your target demographic. More or less, let's just say, if people are assholes, you still try to sell your product to them, regardless of what that product is. It seems, though, that creatives are getting a little fed up with this approach and they're starting to respond to the trolls and haters and just flat out tell them they're wrong, more or less call them out on their bad behavior. Here's a great example from that case of Kelly Marie Tran getting out of social media. Last Jedi director Ryan Johnson tweeted, quote, Done with this disingenuous bullshit. You know the difference between not liking a movie and hatefully harassing a woman so bad she has to get off social media. Those are some pretty strong words, especially from a guy who is still really kind of involved with that franchise. No doubt the people at Disney maybe gave him a phone call after he tweeted that saying, hey, yeah, remember, you kind of obliquely represent us as well because of his involvement with that movie. But still, that's not the kind of thing that you would normally see where somebody would actively call out a fan's bad behavior, especially with relatively strong language. Just point blank say it. It's one thing to say, hey, look, calm down. That's not very fair. But it's something else to say that somebody's acts are disingenuous bullshit. So for me, as a content creator myself and being the target of nasty things, I don't really read YouTube comments all that frequently anymore because of it. I actually... I'm kind of proud of Ryan Johnson for saying that sort of thing, for getting fed up and really taking a stand. Because you know what? It, it is one thing to disagree with the character, to disagree with how something is done or how something was portrayed, and to express it in a logical and forthcoming and genuine manner to just say, hey, look, I didn't like the way that character was portrayed. Here's why. And to calmly and rationally like lay out your arguments for that. But it's something completely different just to say, oh, you suck. Oh, your characters suck. I hope you stop acting. I hope you stop doing whatever. And basically just go straight into trash talking, if not worse. So to break that facade of, oh, everything is happy, shiny PR kind of land and target some of these people, I think shows that we really have hit kind of a tipping point. And it doesn't just stop with that example. Here's another one. The game Battlefield 5. It's been taking some hate from diehard fans, largely people who disagree with the inclusion of female characters in that game. Now, EA's chief creative officer, Patrick Soderlund, told the publication Gamma Sutra, quote, we don't take any flack. We stand up for the cause because I think those people who don't understand it, well, you have two choices. Either accept it or don't buy the game. I'm fine with either or. It's just not okay. And that's taking things, I think, even a little bit further than what Ryan Johnson said. It's one thing to call out fans on bad behavior and tell them to stop. 
But what this guy basically said is, you know what, if you don't like it, don't buy the game. He's actively telling people, you know what, we don't want your money if you're just going to be jerks about it. I'm not sure if this approach long term is going to get picked up by others. I don't know if it'll ever make a real difference long term. All of that remains to be seen, but I do think it's an important development, if nothing else, because it means that something is getting done with these trolls rather than just ignoring them, which is pretty much what everyone has always done. All right, going from Battlefield 5 to Fortnite, and we're talking about Sony this time. As I'm filming this, so you probably know, Fortnite is absolutely huge right now. It is a huge game, absolutely trending. Tons and tons of people are playing it. And as you might expect, it's a cross-platform game. It's encompassing not just traditional game consoles, but also PCs and Macs and mobile devices. So basically, if you've got something that can play games at all, chances are there's a good way for you to play Fortnite. Now, what players have been finding though is that they're not getting full cross-platform play like they might expect. For example, maybe you are playing against someone who's on a PC when you're on a mobile device. What they've been finding is that there are certain combinations of cross-play capabilities that just don't work. And ultimately, it all comes back to Sony. Specifically, players on Fortnite on the PS4 can't cross-play with anybody also playing on an Xbox or Nintendo Switch. Now, Sony's been known to block cross-platform play for quite a while now, and it's not just limited to Fortnite. This has been kind of a policy that they've had that's generally really unfortunate, and another really visible example of this has been Rocket League. A lot of people are still frustrated with that one. But it's been really frustrating to gamers, of course, and made Sony look like the bad guy because, well, it kind of is. But now Sony has upped the ante. Fortnite for Switch recently came out and it's proven to be quite popular, largely because of the whole portability angle that it offers. And there are a decent number of gamers who love the idea of playing the game at home on a powerful console, like sitting on their couch on their big TV with dedicated controller, and then also being able to kind of pick up where they left off on a portable console like their Switch. But what they're now finding is that their accounts for Fortnite are being restricted from use entirely on the Xbox in Switch. Not just that they can't play against people who are using different consoles, but if you logged into your account for Fortnite on a PS4, you then can't subsequently log into it on an Xbox or a Switch, like at all. You get an error message saying you're stuck on the PS4. Now, apparently you can still use it on a mobile device like iOS or on a PC or a Mac, but cutting out Xbox and Switch, especially Switch because of that portability angle, has gotten a lot of people really riled up. Tons and tons of complaints are going into Sony about this, and Sony is just kind of steamrolling over all of them. When asked for comments, Sony just comes back with kind of generic PR statements about, oh, how it's it's committed to the fan base and it's really happy about all the people that are playing the game and blah, 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 blah. It says nothing about, yeah, we're doing this because screw you or anything else. What hasn't been made clear, though, is how this is even being done. That's the part of this story that I haven't really found much decent information about. It's like the account for Fortnite is with Epic Games, the, the company that publishes that game, not with Sony directly. So how is Sony kind of like capturing your Fortnite account to prevent you from using it on a different platform when you're really having that account with Epic. Like, is Epic complicit in this deal somehow, or what? Is there some other technical angle to this that Sony's taking advantage of that isn't exactly clear? I don't know, but 
that's something I think needs to be... Uh, we're going to be waiting for some more information about that one, I think, as time goes on. And we'll see if it's really entirely Sony that's to blame or not. But in any event, it's annoying at best and, well, downright malicious at worst. And as much as I like Sony, I generally like that company and I like the PlayStation platform. This crap needs to stop. This kind of anti-consumer behavior, well, it, let me put it this way. It's really kind of ironic. Sony is the market leader in consoles right now. We've talked about this before, how the PS4 is pretty grossly outselling the Xbox. Switch has always been kind of considered this separate like third console that doesn't really compete against the PlayStation and the Xbox product lines, but PS4 has even sold more than the Switch. You get the idea. But PS4 arguably only got to the position that it has in its generation, or at least it got kicked off to being successful in this generation of consoles due to backlash against Microsoft with the announcement of the Xbox. Remember all that anti-consumer stuff that Microsoft was talking about when it first talked about the Xbox One? Um, the whole lack of like, you can't play use games, it always has to be online, that kind of thing. And everyone is like, yeah, no F that. And Sony is like, when it announced the PS4, it's like, oh yeah, all that stuff that Microsoft wants to do, yeah, no, we're not gonna do that. And everyone's like, yay, PS4. Kind of ironic to think that, okay, so Sony got to the position, arguably, I mean, there's other reasons why PS4 is doing well, too, but arguably it got, you know, in part to the position that it's in because it took a pro-consumer kind of attitude with the console, yet now it's trying to keep its lead by doing anti-consumer things. You tell me how that makes any sense. Will it mean that the next gen of consoles is going to lean more towards a Microsoft's favor because they will have learned that lesson and Sony will have shot itself in the foot with behavior like this? I don't know, but, you know, it's just really kind of funny how history sometimes repeats or doesn't repeat itself in ways. Anyway, that's it for this episode of the podcast i am of course curious as to your thoughts so be sure to leave them down in the comments below if you're interested in audio only versions of these episodes i have them available for patreon supporters at all contribution levels as little as a dollar a month gets you early access to these episodes before they go live here on youtube they're audio only plain mp3 downloads plus there's rss feed support so you can get a private url you throw it into the podcast player of your choice a lot of people love it. It's just another way to help support the channel. I, I'd appreciate it if you'd at least consider it. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.